All right, guys, welcome to my prediction channel on whether the prices will go up or go down for a project over time. Uh, this is part one of part of a two-part series on Polkadot. We're going to go over the governance of Polkadot and whether or not the governance structure of Polkadot will contribute to price performance for the overall product in the long run. And as you can see, I haven't gone over a lot. I have gone over a lot of these details, but I have not filled them in. But we're just going to go over the governance today. And what you can see is everything is green. That's our conclusion, and I'll show you why. But, well, I'm actually going to get right to it. Um, it's an excellent governance model. And here's the details. Okay, so on the left is it a top-down view. On the right is a technical security layer view. These are some notes. We're not even going to look at this. I'll leave that up when I post my image. So we're going to go over the security level layer of Polkadot's governance structure. So these dots represent staked Polkadot. So in the future, we will know that anything that's happening within the Polkadot system is Polkadot that is staked, uh, locked up to the system. And what this means, as you can see, this structure is in many of the roles that are involved in the technical security layer. Um, but what this is, is this is the dot holders that will receive punishment or payments based on their good behavior or bad behavior. And they put stake into the system that is at risk if they behave in a bad way. And that, that stake in the system gives them a reward for like a return on investment for behaving in a good way. And so that's what this little structure is. And it's located everywhere in the different roles of the technical side, the technicals of this uh, security layer. So you have validators, you have fishermen, you have the nominators that all play a role in the con consensus mechanism of this protocol. So validators have, they validate proofs from collators. Collators are, they, they contain the block history for, for the parachain. So, okay, so the way, a, a rough view of what Polkadot is, is it's a blockchain that has many of these other blockchains that come off of it. And many of these, these blockchains that come off of it are bridges to things like Ethereum, you know, other blockchains, or even US. They'll have those abilities on this chain to connect to external blockchains and also run a bunch of independent blockchains on this protocol. So it's like a blockchain of blockchains. And so these little, little blockchains running off of this, they are parachains. So collators, they contain the block history for their parachain. They assist in creating new blocks for those parachains. They take block headers and, tr and transactions and generate new block head, uh, which is the ha hash output, if you know anything about blockchains. They are basically just the proof of work, or like they're, they're like proof of work nodes, you know, like miners in a proof of work system for these independent parachains. So these validators that, are, that surround the collators for those particular parachains, they validate the proofs. They validate the collator information that's sent to them. And they participate in consensus. And you can see here they play that stake role in the whole dynamic of good behavior. They're, they're going to behave good because they put their stake at risk. So all of these, these are blind to each other. They don't know which ones are involved in any of these validation processes. So this is the first layer of security or consensus is if I behave, if this one behaves bad, its information will not align up with the other validators in its local reach. And so, and because it doesn't know who these are, it cannot collude with them. So there is an incentive to behave well. There's a lot of incentive to behave well. And for nominators, 
these guys are the same thing. They have the same structure and they per participate in monitoring and validating the proofs that the validators uh, took from the collators. So the, the, these guys pro process the validators' external output and they output, you can see they all output this. They output validated proofs through the, you know, the validator process. They output these validator proofs and these nominator groups do the same effect that these guys do for a consensus mechanism here to the validator proofs where they don't know who each other, they can't collude with each other. So, and they have to put an amount at stake so that if their information's different than the group, meaning they're putting something through that they want that's different from the group, they can lose the stake. And so what we arrive at is these nominators validate the trust worthiness, they're like validators of the validators, they validate the trustworthiness of the validators, and they determine the overall trustworthiness of those. And these validators perform consensus on the outputted proofs. And these the outdated proofs determinated trustiness, and we get our parachain security, those little blockchain securities. Now another entity before we leave to the next section is a fisherman. This is a cool little guy. He's a bounty hunter. And he just swings around and he just observes the validators as well. And he's just, you know, he just goes around and he puts a very small stake. But he, what he's looking for is one time big rewards. And all he has to do to get that is to prove that somebody's behaving badly. And he's, he's constantly hunting for that very tall amount, that small amount that he puts up to prevent spam. And so you have these guys which add another layer of technical security to uh, the technical uh, behavior of the DOT token. So we are moving over to what this represents is the DOT holders. Whenever we're talking about DOT holders, we're talking about DOT stakers. They're staking. They're putting their tokens up at stake. All right, so this is a top-down view of the governance. Okay, so the stakers, these guys are the ultimate authority, okay? The, the polka dot holders are the ultimate authority. They have a, the majority stake of voting for the polka dot a whole, a stakeholders is that they can do anything. They can do anything, and obviously there's a process for that. But if 100% of them show up, you only need 51% majority. And they can do whatever they want. So they're in control of the network. Now, one cool thing about this project is that it's a beast. It's a chad of a project. And the reason it is, is because I am going to say this, and it is I don't understand why this is the case, but there is no one else that I have noticed in the crypto space that does this, even though it is common sense and it makes sense on every level. But Polkadot has figured it out to finally do this. They lock up their tokens and give extra voting weight for locking the tokens up. And what that does is that gives people with long-term vision control of the network so that it has long-term val validity and, and decision-making I don't know why I have to say that, but there's no other project that does this, and that's that's why Polkadot, I think, is the best blockchain I've ever seen. So take from that what you will. <laughs> All right. So the Polkadot uh, stakers vote, and they override. They can do many things with their vote. So let's look at the participants. You have the Polkadot stakers, you have council members, and you have the technical committee. The technical committee are people, who, programmers who are building Polkadot, and they're voted in from the council members. The council members are voted in from the stakeholders. They vote in the council members. Once again, these guys are the ultimate authority. These guys are representatives. And you know they'll, they'll have a higher level of technicality than these guys. These guys are passive holders in many cases. And so these guys are in charge, like in charge of, of assigning who the technical committee members are. 
Okay, so one of the things that can happen, so there's proposals that, um, proposal referenda that, I, that these, this party and this party can propose. And it, once it's proposed, it becomes an existing referenda and it could be voted to move on or to be vetoed by the council members. If it's passed, it waits 28 days and then the code is implemented. The period of elections is every 28 days for referendums. So 28 days, 28 days, it will have it, this project will be going through uh, progress in 28 day cycles for its process. All right, the, they have the ability to override a veto if they really want to push this thing through. But if it's an emergency thing, most likely, or if it's something that's bad, these guys, you know, these guys and these guys are generally on the same page for a lot of things. All right, so one thing that the technical committee can do and the council members can do is propose emergency ref um, referenda. And in order to pass that, it can, it can, it's, it's on a fast track to the code because it's an emergency. And it takes two thirds of the vote from the technical committee and three fourths of the vote from the council members to fast track this code straight to the code being implemented in three days. All right, I think that's everything. <laughs> Can't believe I got through all that. Okay, so there was a lot of information for this. I had to dig a lot, as you can see. Um, but once again, I'm gonna arrive at the conclusion that this is the best management structure I have ever seen in all of the crypto space. And I've been here for a while, guys. I, I'll just put it that way. The best of the best 